These details will change the way you see episode four of season three of The Chosen. In this episode, we see the disciples in action as Jesus sends them out to heal and to cast out demons. And we begin to build towards some very significant events that will be coming in episode five. In some ways, this may have seemed like a rather simple episode, one that merely lays the foundation for the following episode. But believe it or not, there are certain details that you likely missed that will not only deepen your appreciation for this episode, they may also change the way you see the Gospels. Things like why the Lord's Prayer would have actually already been familiar to most of the people the disciples were teaching it to at the beginning of the episode. Or why some of the Jewish people the disciples served out on their journey would have been absolutely despised by other Jews. I'll help you to understand just how horrible life would have been for the woman with the bleeding condition and why the necklace she wears may highlight just how far she had to go to be healed. So if you're interested in learning these insights as well as others, then join me for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now, before we dive in, let me take a quick moment to thank our sponsor of today's video, Angel Studios. And if you're not familiar with Angel Studios, they're the studio who brought you The Chosen. And now that season three is coming out, you're definitely going to want to download the Angel Studios app. I'm going to share with you a lot of insights and details today that are going to make you want to go back and rewatch every episode of season three. And the Angel Studios app is the place to do that. With the Angel Studios app, you'll be able to enjoy all the seasons of The Chosen, including the new episodes, on your phone and on every major streaming device. Another great thing you can do on the app is pay it forward. The Chosen is free because of the generosity of people like you. And the app makes it easy to spread the show to even more people around the world. When you go to the community tab in the app, you can read about the impact that the show is having on people and hear from those who have been blessed because others have paid it forward. People like John from Virginia. Hey everybody, my name's John I'm from Virginia. A year ago today, I was sitting in jail on Christmas day, missing my family. And this year I sit here and I'm about 70 days clean. And that's a miracle. I honestly believe that this show is gonna help reach others and change their lives in a very similar way. This show shows just how much Jesus loves us. Thank you, Angel Studios. Everyone have a blessed night, have a blessed year. Thank you. Your generosity is truly making an impact. So take some time to check out the app and read through the stories of those who are being blessed. You'll find a link down below in the description or up in the card where you can download the app. And right now, let's dive into our video. While the disciples are on their missionary journey, they share with the communities they visit a prayer that Jesus taught them last season, a prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer. Matthew's gospel records it this way. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. One thing you might not realize, though, is that this prayer would have actually been familiar to many, if not most, of the people who heard it. And the reason that I say that is because, to a certain degree, Jesus didn't make this prayer up himself. And what I mean by that is that throughout the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is using the prayers of others, traditional prayers that people would have prayed every single day. For instance, an ancient Jewish prayer called the Mourner's Kaddish says, exalted and hallowed be God's great name. And Jesus says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Later, the Mourner's Kaddish says, may he establish his kingdom in your lifetime. And Jesus says, thy kingdom come. In another prayer called the 18 benedictions, which observant Jews would pray three times a day, it says, forgive us, O Father, for we have sinned. Whereas Jesus says, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And then we see it in other places. Lead us not into temptation, derives from a prayer from the Talmud. Give us our daily bread, is straight from Proverbs. When he creates the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is drawing upon prayers and scriptures that he would have prayed and recited almost every single day. They were familiar to him and they were familiar to his audience. What Jesus does, though, is fuse these prayers and scriptures together as a template for prayer. 
He combines them, sometimes alters them slightly, in order to guide his disciples and us in our daily prayers. In many ways, he's doing what any good rabbi would do, taking the scripture and tradition and giving it his own spin, his own unique interpretation that he would expect his disciples to pass along to others, just like they did in this scene. When the disciples gather after they've all returned from their missionary journeys, they speak of the different places that they've been and the people that they've reached. And at one point, Philip mentions how he and Andrew were in the Decapolis preaching to Gentiles and Hellenistic Jews who, as he puts it, hated us just as much as they hate each other. In that one sentence is packed a whole lot of geography and history that changes the way we understand the area where Jesus led his ministry and the relationships that existed therein. And so let me start first with the location. Jesus sent Philip and Andrew to an area around the Galilee called the Decapolis. Often in the Gospels, this is the place we see referred to as the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It is a predominantly pagan area, heavily influenced by the culture and religion of Rome. Which actually leads us to the other thing that Philip said, which is that this area is filled with Gentiles and Hellenistic Jews. Now, when Philip says Gentiles, he's actually using a generic term. Gentile is a term used to refer to anyone who's not Jewish, but in this situation, he's specifically applying it to pagan Romans, and by that I mean Romans who worship the Roman gods and the emperor. Judaism is a religion that from its beginnings is strongly opposed to pagan religion, and anything really that would draw its people away from the Lord. And it's this feature of Judaism that actually highlights a problem with the final group he mentioned in this situation, the Hellenistic Jews. By calling them Hellenistic Jews, Philip is indicating that these are people of Jewish ancestry. They are ethnically Jewish. They might even practice some aspects of Judaism. But for the most part, these are Jewish people who have compromised their Jewish faith in order to adopt the popular culture and ideals of Rome. You see, Hellenism is a term used to refer to Greek culture that dates back to Alexander the Great. It's a culture that values philosophy and art. It places high value on the human body and depicts this through nude statues, athletic events, and the gymnasium. And it is a culture in which all of these things and more are tied back to the pantheon of gods. Even though the Roman Empire ruled throughout the world, it was still this Greek culture of Hellenism that was truly in vogue. And Hellenism could not have been more different than Jewish culture. The Greek way of thinking, the flaunting of the human body, the worship of other gods, these things were detestable to faithful Jews. For the past few centuries, countless Jews had given their lives to oppose the infiltration of Hellenistic culture. So when Philip mentions Hellenistic Jews, everyone around him knows that this is a group that truly needs saving. They've been corrupted, and Jesus has come to heal them along with everyone else. In many ways, this reminds us of the fight between faith and culture that we have today. I mean, how often do we feel like the beliefs of many Christians are compromised by the power of the culture around them? How often do you look at your own life and realize that the shows you watch or the magazines you read or the news you listen to is impacting your worldview and outlook more than the Gospels are? I mean, we all struggle with this, which is a reminder that we all need saving. It's the sobering reality that if Jesus were here today, he might actually send his disciples to come preach the gospel to us, those who bear the name of Christ today, just like Hellenistic Jews bore the name of God back then. And it's yet another way that the chosen helps us ever so subtly to put ourselves into the scriptures in ways we might never have before. One of the major topics introduced in episode four is that of disease and how those afflicted were treated in the first century. And as we can see pretty quickly, life was not good for those who were sick. When Jesus healed the leper in season one, when the disciples were exercising demons and curing diseases in the opening scenes, whenever anyone is freed from an illness, that person is not only restored physically, they're also being restored socially, which in many cases was the even greater healing. You see, in the first century Jewish culture, sickness and disease were understood not only as physical ailments, but also as spiritual ones. There was a strong belief that your physical circumstances were a consequence of your sin or the sins of your ancestors. 
It was believed that the pain you were experiencing could actually be the result of the sins of someone who lived generations before you. So even just for this reason, ailments could have painful social consequences. But there were also some sicknesses that were even worse. Because not only did they come with social stigma, they also came with social separation. For instance, the woman that Eden meets in this episode, Veronica, says that she not only has no husband, but also that she has not been able to see her parents or even enter their home in years because of her bleeding condition. She warns Eden to stay away because if they touch, Eden herself will be socially outcast. You see, in Leviticus 15, it says, when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time, other than her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge, just as in the days of her period. Any bed she lies on while her discharge continues will be unclean, as is her bed during her monthly period. And anything she sits on will be unclean, as during her period. Anyone who touches them will be unclean. They must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and they will be unclean till evening. Now, in general, this practice of separation wasn't necessarily seen as a bad thing. Right? Just before this passage, Leviticus talks about separation for women who have their period. And to be sure, women weren't shamed for this. There's no suggestion that this is something sinful or evil. These are simply laws of ritual purification. What makes Veronica different, though, is that her situation is ongoing. Her bleeding never stops. She is never able to truly purify herself, so she is never able to fully re-enter society. And what's more, since this condition is ongoing, it arouses suspicion. As we said earlier, people saw a connection between sin and disease. They're tempted to believe that her bleeding condition is a sign of something more sinister. And they want nothing to do with it. I mean, this would have been a sad, lonely life for Veronica. And it prepares us to witness how when she's healed, she will experience salvation far greater than a cured disease. Her, her healing will be physical, and it will be social. And it will also be spiritual, which leads us to our last insight. As Eden and Veronica are washing their clothes, Veronica mentions that there is no cure for the disease that she has. In fact, she has spent all of her money on doctors, which begs the questions, what were doctors like at that time? And what would someone with a disease like this typically do to be healed? I mean, it's not hard to imagine that someone afflicted for this long would have sought some sort of remedy. And as you might imagine, the options out there weren't always ideal. For one thing, for a long time, physicians were not accepted within the Jewish community. I mean, rarely do we see physicians in scripture, and often they're viewed negatively, right? They're seen as an alternative to trusting the Lord. For instance, in 2 Chronicles, King Asa is criticized with scripture saying, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. God was supposed to be the primary healer. And for that reason, most treatments took place in the home in the form of vigils with prayer and fasting. Things had changed, however, by the time of Jesus. In the second century BC, Ben Sira, a Jewish scribe, writes, honor doctors for their services, since indeed the Lord created them. This, in many ways, is a consequence of the advancement of medicine and the influence of Hellenistic culture, in which medicine was a growing field. That said, even though the use of physicians was increasing in the first century, most people would have sought remedies through folk healers, herbalists, and religious intermediaries. You see, just as Jews believed that God would intervene and heal them, so did pagans. The deities Asclepius and Isis were both known for their acts of healing. Various acts could be done to entice the favor of gods. And then, of course, in addition to all of this, there was the age-old practice of magic. Spells and incantations believed to work wonders and procure good fortune. Which leads us to Veronica's necklace. Now, there is no suggestion that the necklace Veronica is wearing is anything more than a necklace. But it's a reminder. It's a reminder of a common practice that someone in a situation as desperate as hers would likely have resorted to in hopes of being cured. And that is the use of amulets. 
Amulets were jewelry that would be imbued with charms and spells intending either to entice good fortune or ward off bad fortune. They would be used to resolve all sorts of injuries and ailments from infertility to bleeding. What all of this reminds us of is the links to which people would go to be healed at the time of Jesus. I mean, just like today, people were searching for salvation and they would go anywhere they could to find it. Which challenges us, doesn't it? I mean, it forces us to ask ourselves the question, where do I look when I'm in trouble? Where's the first place I go? I mean, when you get sick or, or when you find yourself in trouble, what's your first impulse? Is it to go to the Lord or to go to a doctor? Or, or maybe to some other person or product that you think can provide the solution? Because let's be honest, right? The temptation to look somewhere other than Jesus is strong. You know, in ancient Greek, the word that means healed is the word sozo. But sozo also has another meaning. It can also mean saved. In fact, sometimes doctors and other healers would also be referred to by another name, saviors. See, it's a powerful reminder of the battle that Jesus was fighting and is still fighting to be recognized as our true savior. The evidence is all there. The work has been done. His place is established. And yet other things still vie for our hearts. Other things still cry out, no, I'm what will truly save you. And so let me ask you, is Jesus truly your savior? Do you look to him, trust him, rely upon him above everything else? What in your life is trying to get in the way of that? And how do you get that thing out of your life? Because as we've seen and will continue to see, so many other people and things out there can make promises. But in the end, there is only one true Savior, one true Lord, and that's Jesus. Well, that's it for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now make sure to click the link above or down in the description so you can download the Angel Studios app and go back and check out all the scenes that I just highlighted. And if you're interested in seeing more of my videos on each episode of The Chosen, just click this link right here. Thank you so much for watching today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.